Hello, everyone, and welcome to our weekly open news meeting. I'm James Harding. I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise. And this week, we're going to try and do something slightly different. Uh, I'll tell you the origin of this. I was sitting around last week thinking... I really am unclear what to make of the government's decision to bring forward the end of COVID restrictions. And if that feels like, quote unquote, the end of the pandemic in the UK, how did we do? And if you're a member of Tortoise, or at least have been for a while, or a part of the team at Tortoise, you'll know we did the COVID inquiry, which tried to, at the end of 2020, make sense of what the UK's performance had been, but so many questions were left hanging. And I thought that by now, in effect, I'd be able to go online and rattle through either ONS data or NHS data or government data and get some kind of meaningful sense of how the UK had done. And actually what's quite surprising was how hard it is to find out sensibly how the UK has done. And so on Monday, when we got together in our weekly internal meeting, we talked about trying to do a tally of the UK and look at what we know now, whether it's in terms of infections, hospitalizations, fatalities, but also costs and politics, tax, debt, unemployment, the hidden cost of the pandemic, whether it's in education or healthcare or mental health. And so, Across the team at Tortoise, we've been trying to get to some of that data, figure out what we do know, and I suppose, as interestingly, what we don't. So in the course of the coming hour, as in all open news meetings, we're really open to hear what you think. If there are stories we should be going after, if there are angles we should be going after, just put them in the chat and I'll make sure to come to you and bring them in. Just to give you a sense of it, um, we were lucky to be joined by Andrew Brown, um, who talked a little bit about Church of England, Christ Church, Martin Percy, and we're trying to now pursue that and see how we do that more properly. So I just want you to know those efforts don't go to waste. They're really, really helpful. But we're going to certainly dedicate the first half, possibly a little more, to trying to get to this grips with this question of how did the UK fare in the COVID-19 pandemic with a view to, I suppose, two things in particular, possibly three. One is a follow-up to the COVID inquiry as a thinking. Um, how might we tackle that in March and April? Two, is there room for either a slow newscast or a sense maker audio or some investigation in our podcasts? And three, for our sense makers, are there angles or elements of this that we need to uh, look into? Um, I I'm. I'm going to go briefly first just to Phoebe, because Phoebe, you've directed some of the traffic here in the last day or two. Um, how, do, how do you best want to do this? Do you want to, I know that you've personally looked into sort of some of the kind of social mental health aspects, but do you think we should start there or do you think we should start with kind of pull on fatalities and hospitalizations and the medical end? Did, did you amongst yourselves think there's a kind of running order to this? Yeah, I think it'd be good to kind of start with like the basis. And I think also from having conversations earlier today, um, we have kind of a, day, a daily meeting anyway, but chatting with Giles was that, you know, there's crossovers when you talk about mental health of young people, you're talking about education. But I think it would be yeah, good to start maybe with Paul. Um, and I know that, um, I know this is a slightly separate conversation to talk about government comms, but I think Barney's um, done some good work there as well. So that might be a good place to start. Okay, look, it looks as though Paul, as we like him, is locked into a work cubicle. As, as usual. Um, as usual, as ever, shackled to your desk. Okay, Paul, so what's the, what is the answer to the sort of very, very basic by the numbers, infections, hospitalizations, long-term sickness and death? Sure. So I, I looked at deaths and the a useful starting point would be the cumulative number of deaths when um, Tortoise began its COVID inquiry, so around November 2020. And by that point, cumulative deaths were already at 55,000 for the UK. Um, the interesting thing is that date marked a halfway point up this um, rise to a new peak 
of a about 130,000 deaths by spring 2021. Um, and ever since then, of course, largely because of the vaccine rollout, the rate of increase was much slower. And over, over the entire period to today, the country only added about 30,000 more cumulative deaths. So a, a cumulative total over the pandemic of 160,000 deaths. So this is measured as, as deaths um, within 28 days of a positive test result. Um, the interesting thing, I think, about the UK, like a lot of other countries, um, where you have very high regional inequality, is you had mortality rates varying along the lines of, of that inequality. So of course, most people who are dying were elderly, but even after you adjust for um, differences in, in population age structures, you find that mortality rates were almost four times higher in the most deprived areas of the country uh, than the more affluent ones. In, in part, um, because infections were much higher there, um, but really, or ultimately, because the underlying health of those local populations was much worse. So life expectancy was already low, unemployment high, housing worse, child poverty high. Um, so it is a very unequal spatial pattern of death. And, and, and Paul, can I just two mm -hmm. text? So the cumulative deaths of 160,000, if you yes. want to compare with, let's say, the US, Germany, I don't know, India slash Singapore, Morocco, if, if you're trying to do comparisons, how, how does the UK excess deaths number compare with other countries? Is that the best way overall, given different reporting approaches to COVID deaths? So the so in terms of cumulative numbers, the UK the UK is actually still very high, so it's within the top top ten. Um, but of course, there are con some of the countries you mentioned have enormous populations. So yes. India, um, so you have you know over half a million deaths in India on a per capita basis. Um, the UK is again still quite high. So you know, between two and 300 deaths per capita, but actually not as bad as, as many other countries, many in Latin America, many in Europe. So Hungary has a much higher death rate, almost double, um, Romania. Uh, so on a per capita basis, it's still, you know, in a global distribution of countries, it's within the top, top 10%, top 10, 15%. Um, so, so not a great performance, unfortunately. And then, and then, just on that, you know, on your district, your socio-economic distribution. So, yeah, the, the the when you say four times higher mortality rates, what kind of? Yes. I remember you did that. You did that. Do you remember you did that? You, of course, you remember. You, you did that map of the UK by those yes. what were they, seven thousand household units. Yes, that's right. So there are statistical units um, called middle super output areas, um, which are, are drawn to kind of contain 2,000 people um, in a new two thousand. Two th sorry, 2,000, you say, people? 2,000 people um, okay. across, across England. Um, in this case, we're talking more, more about local authority units. So the... Um, so deprivation is measured actually also at those, those much finer units. But um, when you compare deprivation, which is this broad-based index of, of health and income, unemployment, all that, all that um, to COVID um, mortality rates, you get this very strong relationship. So, you know, the more deprived an area, the much more likely you are to die from COVID. And, and, and so that doesn't map neatly into north, south, rural, urban. Those are spotted in those, in those areas. 
it it can i mean to varying degrees um to the extent that you know there are of course parts of london which are which are really deprived um where you'll have really high death rates but um if you if if you kind of zoomed out then you would see a, a north south gradient and would you see and um, would you see a sort of covid extension of the marmot review i.e if you had lower income lower life expectancy you had a higher incidence of covid fatality is it you would. Way? i i i i mean i think you would i i okay. expect you would so okay. he, he would be so good to get back he he would be good to he would be good to get back he would be really good to get back in I think so. The so the Marmot review, of course, is it was really innovative in that it it looked at health inequalities by um, income inequalities. So, simply put, people with lower incomes tended to die earlier, um, and you'd expect the same the same pattern here, um, which is really shocking if if you stop and think about it. Yeah. that um, already very disadvantaged areas were hit by the same um, virus, but affected in a much worse way. Okay, well, we, and, and Paul, before I just, I want to go back to Phoebe in a second, because I'd like to know if we're doing a sort of straight kind of infections, fatalities numbers, I want to think about the mental health hangover too, and I'm going to come to you, Phoebe, about that in a sec. But Paul, I sort of want to ask everyone this, is when you looked at the numbers, what do you think is the thing that we, we don't know? What, what if you were sort of king of ONS for a day, you would marshal people to go and find out? I, one, one pattern is that infections also tend to be higher in more deprived areas. And I, won, I mean, there are some explanations in that Often people in these areas had less opportunity to say shield themselves to lockdown. Um, where in work, where you were brought into contact with with the virus more easily. But I don't know if there's a kind of conclusive picture of of why why infections were higher in these places. I find that quite interesting. And is there, and by the way, sorry, before I is there a coordinated effort to make sure that globally we're comparing apples and apples? Is there an OECD or a WHO effort to make sure that the numbers are fairly compared? There, there is. So there are there are a bunch of trackers, and they all do um, they, on an international level. Anyway, the um, they will do kind of the same job of comparing deaths, infections, vaccine rollout quite effectively. Um, so the WHO has one, um, the EU does one, um, Tortoise actually did one, um, the arms race tracker, which was more focused on the vaccine rollout. But um, these patterns we've just been describing, uh, so within country patterns rather than between country patterns, are I think much less understood. I think international comparisons of kind of differences within countries would be really hard. But even on a even on an individual country basis, I think we're still very far behind understanding yeah. why the virus spread so differently within a country and why people were so affected um, differently by that by that spread. That's a really, really good thing for us to look at, I think, because, I mean, do you remember when you did that very first thing for us, the opioids yes. um, mapping? What was amazing was how different prescription rates were in different parts of the country. And I wonder whether or not if you did COVID within the country, some COVID within the country, whether that's your you know, underlying health conditions, socioeconomic or NHS treatment, I wonder whether you come away thinking certain NH hospitals perform very differently from other ones. It's quite within the country, it'd be a really good thing for us to look at. 
I think so. And I think the point on, on healthcare, I mean, healthcare performance obviously varies within country yeah. as well. Yeah. And I yeah. wonder if underneath that deprivation pattern, you're also picking that up. Do that. Um, yeah. Okay. Paul, I'm going to go because I know that there's like a world of people who've got thoughts and things to say. Phoebe, can we do the flip of that? The mental health um, I, hangovers are kind of bad way of talking about it but what the impact has been and I don't know how you begin how you begin to sort of slice it yeah so there's actually I think there's quite a useful way I've been kind of reading through government reports um various groups reports Nuffield has done some great work King's Fund has done some great work on this um and there's kind of a way to look at it like there's the general population um and overwhelmingly you're looking at the most affected being young women uh between the ages of kind of 18 to uh to 35 kind of moving up towards into the 20s so me uh, as a 25 year old young woman um but also um kind of as paul said areas of deprivation um areas and it'd be interesting to see if those kind of areas map up in terms of mental health impacts something we kind of briefly chatted about earlier was grief and that's kind of its impact in, in those kind of communities um and the other kind of sections of it are people who've been working on the front line, um, which is something I flagged, I flagged before when I was kind of doing the researching on psychedelics and the NHS and kind of the worries about frontline health workers seeing an increased rate of PTSD. Um, and then the other side of that as well is long COVID um, and people who've been on ventilators. It's um, being in an ICU unit, if, if anyone's ever kind of seen them um, beyond kind of films. Um, it's, it's incredibly intensive, being on a ventilator is intensive, there's a long term impact of that on your mental health, um, and we don't quite know the neurological impacts of long COVID either. So I'd say there's like those kind of three sections, and it's tackling those in, in, in different bits in terms of government strategy, but um, something I'm, I'm really interested in is the women's health strategy that's kind of been delayed and delayed, uh, but should hopefully be coming in the spring, um, I think coinciding with the uh, digital, sorry, the health disparities report that was announced in the leveling up report so i'm hoping that there's going to be some good thinking or at least analysis of um data they've picked up on women's health and how they tackle it especially especially mental health so that's kind of where my head's at as like a broader picture but there's i, I think there's that you know it's, well, it's really very broad Phoebe, slow down slow down Let, let's just do one thing at a time so yeah. so women 18 to 35 that may feel very obvious to you because you know you know a little bit about that demographic. It seems very odd to me. Why would you have a very high instance of mental health issues in a section of the population which has been not heavily impacted by fatalities or indeed infections? Yeah, so that's the other side of it. It's kind of the, the other side. So, um... If you're thinking about uh, higher instances of domestic violence, that's one aspect. Um, it's also important to say that things like PTSD might be picked up at that kind of age gap. gap. So if there is any instance of PTSD, it might be appearing also in the age gap. Um, single mothers um, kind of who've had increased financial strain, they've had their children at home. Um, that's one aspect of it. They've also seen kind of financial strains because of that. Um, they were less likely to be able to, to pick up work and, and those kind of efforts to, to help, which we, I'm sure we can talk about later. Um, that, you know, it's it's just, a, Phoebe, hold on a second. Are, mm. there two, what, are you saying that actually, because there are two different views on there, the pandemic. One is that things have changed and the other is that everything is revealed. Is it more that there have been all of these underlying factors and there's a greater attention being paid and understood around mental health. And that's what we're seeing, or whether or not the COVID itself is causing a different, putting a different mental toll on women of 18 to 18 to 35. It's probably a combination of both. So what's, what has been good is this kind of continual tracking of anxiety and depression um, by gender. And then and there's a few places, I'll, I'll put a link in the chat, into the into the tracker because you can kind of see and it matches up on the on the lockdowns um but obviously i think there was already an existing existing issues that were already there childcare issues um 
it's you know and, and something that was also I guess the assumption would have been is that and, that and that's not to say it has been an impact on on older people for example if you've been shielding if you have other health impacts but it's the idea of resilience and the ability of someone to kind of deal with the the things that they are facing as a as a young woman um and yeah it's like the, the, there's so many factors obviously it's quite easy to do a broad stroke and also of course this is self-reporting these are surveys of women saying that i feel anxious and i have seen some good stuff on men being less likely to say things like i am feeling anxious i am feeling depressed um mm -hmm which can also affect it. So that's the broad brushstroke of it. But I do think there's some key points. I think even if you drill down to something like eating disorder services, which does largely affect young women, um, there's been some good analysis that, you know, the amount of people going towards eating disorder services has increased, waiting times have increased, and, and the, the, the capacity there to look after those women um, isn't available. So, yeah. So let, let me, you know, what, I'm going to just, rather than just sort of, if you like, going around the clock of every everyone, I just want to pause there, Phoebe, and just sort of take stock of the things that both you and Paul have said, because there's a point made by Charlotte in the chat. I'd like to come to Charlotte about this, about the sort of record of the four nations, because they obviously ran different policies. Um, Liz picked up on the point around what the pressures were on young women and therefore mental health, because we talked a lot about that quite a lot in the first six months of the pandemic, particularly around, as you said, unemployment, domestic violence, etc. And Lucy Hoopman has been um, talking a good deal about kind of good sources on this information, particularly around independent sage. And I want to come to Maggie Harding, if I can. Uh, just around um, this point that she's made around hospital data confounding. Um, I want to know what this confounding, so I shall come to that in a second. Um, let's, uh, Lucy, why don't I go to you first, if I might? Because um, you pointed to a whole bunch of different things on this, um, but both on the health side and on the mental health side. Are you there? I'm here. I'm not going to start. Oh, God. I'm going to stop my video because I'm, I'm not very well. Okay. Um, okay. The, um, uh, uh, um, it's, it's great you're all looking into it. A lot of these fundamental stats have been done yeah. um, throughout the last 18 months, particularly in the team that you could definitely invite on of Independent Sage. And the, the um, Christina Pargel, she's kind of been taken up by Newsnight a lot, and Kit Yates, they are the top two. Right. Okay. Um, but the breakdown by local authority, the four nations, the different policies, I mean, it's been, you know, they've had literally two hours every Friday for nearly the last two years. And even if you speak to, I can't remember the name of the guy who set it up, who's fantastic, they'll, I'm sure they'll share. Well, um, I believe Matt Dancona has been involved in it, so he will right. um, I he'll help. I, yeah. well, I get, but Lucy, are you, you sound like you're much, much more deeply engaged in the detail of this. My, my I issue, researched it for you last year, my article. Yeah, but, but that's the mental health side. What I'm talking about is actually the, the, the physical health side. What, what I found really quite striking was still how hard it is to try and get a meaningful sense of how the UK has performed because the numbers seem to be measured either, anyway, there's a, there's a personal point, but do you, think, do you think that when you stand back, having looked at what the mental health impacts have been and what the physical health impacts have been, that you've got a judgment on how the UK has done? Um, I, I, I just looked at other figures that were being published. I mean, we did very, very badly in terms of deaths per, per population level, very badly. We were the worst. We were reported as the worst mainly throughout and one of the most developed richest countries. And that may be, um, as you were saying earlier, Phoebe and other people that our health inequalities were revealed and um, that's what you saw. It may be, um, well, there are any number levels of, of, of reasoning, but if you look back over the figures that are there and were written about at the time, we came out worst um, all the way through. And when the vaccine came along, you know, all we heard about was the vaccine. So mm. it was a very good way of stopping that, stopping that sort of judgment, judgment and, and pushing it forwards into a, pushing it forwards into a inquiry or whatever. Yeah. Um, I, we, we were, I mean, 
it is hard to stand back, but we were slow to lock down. We were slow to, um, we didn't really accept masks. And if we accepted masks, we didn't accept proper masks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a lot of talk at the time. I remember about the person of the chief medical officer whose research history is, is very big on herd immunity as a concept. Yes. So, you know, there's, it took, I, I mean, it took journalists and it took politicians and it took everyone at least six months to even begin to think about what might be happening. And the flu concept wasn't dropped for a very, very long time. Um, I'd be a bit hard pressed. I didn't know what you were going to talk talk about this tonight, but I I could look back over. Yeah, but it would be it would be it would be yeah, it'd be great, Lucy. I'm I'm going to just bring in a few other people. Yes, please I, do. I want to make sure, I want to make sure that um, people know I'm going to come to them. Um, th there's lots to get at here, and you know I really appreciate people like Aid Tulo who are sort of also just flagging up some stories that we are missing altogether. This Serbia story, which I'm going to come to him about towards the end of our hour, if he's happy to stick with us. Um, let, let's just do some things that I, uh, Maggie Harding, as far as I know, no relation, but who knows, maybe I'm about to meet a long, long lost relative, but Maggie, assuming we're not related, I am really intrigued by what you're saying around, uh, hospital and hospital data. What, what, what did you mean by that? I meant that some of the best data is actually on um, COVID is actually deaths because we do record deaths pretty well. Um, whether they're from COVID or with COVID is a, a slightly debatable point, but the case numbers have always been flawed by testing and um, as testing of those who are symptomatic. Hospitalizations certainly in the first two or three waves were quite well documented as to whether they were for COVID. Right. Um, we got testing not very well in the first wave, but actually they were doing a lot of CT scans and MRI scans for diagnosis. But because we had very limited capacity, ITU capacity, and in the first two, three waves, um, if, if one separates um, Delta from Alpha, there were a lot of hospital admissions of seriously ill people, and certainly hospitals, not all of them could cope. And I don't know the full extent of mutual aid, but we've been talking about mutual aid in the health service for quite a long time and in resilience for and various other places. And it means that when hospitals are under stress, they will transfer patients. And there are instances that a lot of intensive care, um, respiratory medics know of where ill patients, ambulances were sent to transfer ventilated patients with mostly within the same region, but uh, there were certainly interregional transfers, depending on where there were beds, where there were ventilators and where there were nurses. And hospital data is probably also flawed by your basic starting staffing levels. I mean, London has got a lot more staff in hospitals, they're teaching hospitals, they've got all their research staff who were drafted in to the patient face. Um, and so you're not really comparing like with like. Uh, uh, Maggie, is, is this your, sorry, is this your area of expertise? Do you work in this area? No, I'm retired. Uh, I was a public health doctor and I um, agree with, I think it was Lucy on Independent Sage. Right. Uh, okay, just, good, just a point about this. Just this hospital's point, just so we understand it, because we tried, you know, at a time when everyone was applauding at eight o'clock in the evening. And I always think, you know, that applause was rather great in that it was applause for people who were showing great courage. But it then became blurred into a sort of carpet approval for the performance of the NHS. And, and I think that there are lots of people who, with a bit more time, are saying, actually, the performance of the NHS you know, hospital by hospital was really variable. Do, do you think that if you if you did try to map it now, 
it would be impossible to tell really because of this mutual aid point, i.e. hospitals were transferring very sick people and it was therefore very hard to see in the end which hospitals truly performed exceptionally well or exceptionally badly. I think probably the other thing is that I'm um, a reader of the Health Services Journal and in that there were some devastating reports of these teams that went out very possibly from well-staffed teaching hospitals to retrieve seriously ill patients and what they described um, these staff about the hospitals and the situation in the hospitals from which they were retrieving patients was frankly quite appalling now exactly why that had arisen mm -hmm. one doesn't know but it was probably because at the height of the pandemic, nobody could really turn ambulances away. Mm -hmm. You had to accept patients. And, you know, it was looking as though some institutions or parts of some institutions were almost out of control. Yeah. And I'm willing to bet that if the public inquiry is as good as it should be, quite a lot of this will emerge yeah. Because it's the people on the ground who really know what was going on. Yeah. Ma Maggie, thank you. Um, I think you're right, although I do think that, you know, you're prompting us to go back and have a look at that health services journal reporting, because I think picking up a thread like that and going back and revisiting it might actually help us understand what happened and what happened in some of these hospitals. Um, I just want to pick up on a few more people before I go come to you in a second, Barney, on just sort of what's happened in, in government. But I, I wanted to, if I can, um, just go to Greg Mulligan. Greg, if you're there, because you made a point about what you were learning in terms of uh, illness in the community you were serving, I think a church community, is it? If you're there, are you there? Oh, I can see your screen, but you're muted. Are you, can you join us, Greg? Greg, I'm come, I'll come back to you in a moment. I hope you can, because I'd really love to hear what you think. Uh, Aki and Claude, you, you touched on something in the chat, which was also around race and infection. Yes. Um... Uh, Fatality, I was going to so say, because a big, a big focus in 2020, which seems to be getting less attention these days, is just the mix of people who, who were dying, certainly in that first wave, possibly two waves of the pandemic. Mm. So basically, there's been a diversity issue. And the factor is what I found and I was told is within STEM, there's not the representation of diversity and also inclusion. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense why they've had this issue where the black community have not been able to take up the vaccine, but also they don't feel that they are got the evidence. Like, for example, most artists like uh, Nile Rogers and many people are very sceptical about what is in the vaccine and rightly so. And I think, uh, you know, we have to think about human rights. We have to think about the importance that people can choose instead of feeling that they are being forced within, like, for example, we've had that no jab, uh, no jab, no job. And mm -hmm. most health professionals, of course, left the profession, which really made a big impact on the profession. And I have to also wonder how long will this pandemic go on when the fact is there is other big issues, like there is one in four children that may not be able to swim and of course will probably drown because they don't know how to swim. So you have to think about diversity, you have to think about representation. Oh, hold on, hold on, okay. to... just, hmm? sorry, I, I, sorry, sorry for interrupting. I just need to make sure one is that that, that swimming statistic, I just want to go and make sure I checked it because I don't know, you're saying one in four of which children can't swim? So one in four of school students, so children that are basically would be like a school age, um, would not be able to swim because they haven't been learnt the skills to swim. And this has been an issue for some time because we don't have representation in more, swimming. So, sorry, are you, saying one, are you saying one in four children across children. the UK or black children? Or what's the... One in four of black children would not be able to swim. Okay, I, I want to go and check that. I, I, can, I, can I just put something to you, which I don't know yet, which is 
Paul mentioned right at the top that what you're seeing is a very, what, you, what we saw was a quadruple, a fourfold increase in the likelihood of fatality in the most deprived areas of the country versus, I think, the mean, the median, if I got that right, Paul. The, the, the question in the first year of the pandemic was even accounting for that deprivation, even accounting for poverty, lower incomes, you were still seeing even higher rates of fatality for black, Asian, minority, ethnic, British citizens. And I wondered why you think that was. Because this is pre-vaccine, remember. I think there is a big issue in the fact that, as I said, if you don't have the representation within these professions, then they are not going to be able to understand the health of that community. And I think that what is very concerning is within the scientists' advice that we've had and within the recent messaging, we haven't heard anything from Chris Wickey. And you have to wonder, like, it's all very well making a vaccine, but when you don't know the community and their health, because mm -hmm my health is different to a white person and the factor is is that basically if you don't have a, a black nurse or a black doctor then sure. it's going to be an issue and i think there is that factor but i have to importantly say that diversity is a big issue within the united kingdom and the fact of that we've had um, big named professionals that have left the profession, profession because they've been forced to have a vaccine. When we've had a consultant who said that he felt there wasn't enough evidence when Savage asked if anyone is concerned by the new measures that was brought in. So you have to think of choice and you have to think of human rights for an individual. Yeah. Okay, Michael, thank you. I, I think, by the way, I don't know whether you, you may have not seen in the chat as you were speaking, Lucy made the point about diabetes, which I suppose speaks exactly to your question, your, your point, which is you have to understand the health profiles of, of people, not just by where they live and how they work. Um, so I think that is something to, something to come back to. And thank you, Ellen, for just kind of clarifying that point about the data on um, kids. Um, I, I, I know that we've got quite a few points and there are quite a few people I'd like to um, come back to, I did say that I just hear from Liz, because Liz, you just made some point that picks up on Phoebe's points about women's mental health. Um, I know that was a while ago and how, but it did feel like something we really talked and thought a lot about in 2020. And it, is it just me or does it feel like the, we're not talking or thinking about it as much, certainly in public policy circles now? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I think that we did a couple of thinking um sort of about halfway through i mean it's ludicrous to talk about it in those terms um where we examined properly do you remember with oliver cam and then we did another one yeah. um we tried to properly get to grips with what do we what are we talking about when we talk about mental health and yeah. um, she says aging women cover and um and i think that one of the challenges um, with some of the data, and I don't know the data that Phoebe was quoting, so I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not here to judge. One of the challenges, and why you might react in the way that you do, um, is that the the way that the data is collected is based on the basis of self-reporting. And do you feel anxious? I, I mean, obviously, I feel anxious. I, I don't, I don't know if you've seen the world. You know, there's, there's a bit yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, and and so um, I don't know if that is a barrier necessarily to it being taken seriously from a public policy level, but I think it is a barrier and sometimes increased awareness of people's mental ill health, mental ill health, excuse me, and how to handle that. Um, you know, I don't think everybody's as mentally ill as perhaps they report to be. But that doesn't mm. help them <laughs> by the same token. So um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure um, how, how it stacks up because I, my, my tendency is to say with that particular demographic that Phoebe was talking about, she mentioned the domestic violence, obviously insecure work, low pay, caring responsibilities. That demographic was absolutely walloped again and again and again and again um, by things that were caused by the pandemic, but not necessarily the pandemic itself. Those things pre-existed and um, a public policy design around mental health wouldn't necessarily affect any of those things that I, I, I'm much more interested in looking at those things necessarily than saying young women's mental health is, is, is shocking because I think young men's is, and old women's and old men's as well. 
I think there's, I think there is a, I think the weird thing is how do you handle this too in a way that allows for a great deal of sophistication because there's the kind of complexity of human experience. And by the way, hats off to you for the Raymond Carver reference. <laughs> but the, the, the difficulty is also the politics of this are gonna be driven by simple questions. You right. know, did old people have a worse time than younger people? Did women have a worse time than men? Did city people have worse time than rural? Kind of, you know, mm -hmm. and, and people will then allocate quite big or make choices about resource allocation on those kinds of judgments because that's the way politics works. And so mm -hmm. getting after that will be, um, will be really helpful. Liz, thank you. Um, I, I'm going to come to um, uh, Emma J in a moment in terms of resources and economics because uh, the great James Wilson is going to hopefully help us think through whether or not the country has spent its money wisely. But Barney, um, do, you, do you just want to pick up on the point that kind of Liz and I would just begin to get to there, which is how government changed in this whole uh, in this last two years? Yes, absolutely. So I mean. The thing I, I would pull out kind of immediately is obviously we've had two years of, of, of lockdown breaches um, by, by various members of the government. Uh, and it's kind of interesting to sort of speculate, you know, does this raise the question of how Downing Street actually operates? Um, and so far, the attempt to kind of reboot that has, has been to kind of shift personnel around. Um, but in particular, I pull out the kind of communications department because this is a place that's seen four different heads over the space of, uh, you know, Johnson's premiership uh, and a kind of substantial churn basically in civil service as well beneath that. And, and that's kind of un unprecedented. Um, yeah. And just to give you a bit of a context for that. So um, more than half of the, the 20, uh, 21 biggest civil service jobs have been imposed for no more than 18 months, um, according to the Institute for Government. That's just slightly more than the average tenure of a football manager. Um, and of course, many departments also are seeing this kind of massive churn in, in civil service as well. And you sort of wonder what the sort of long term effect of that is going to be, uh, you know, further down the road, especially for the comms department, they've got these big communications challenges like the cost of living. And, you know, I, I think John Major, John Major's letter was right in saying that, you know, we need someone to be candid about this. Um, and obviously that is Johnson does not have a good track record on that. He is not honest. But, uh, you know, th there's there's learnings from some of the campaigns that the, the, the comms department has pulled off. For example, stay at home right at the beginning of the pandemic. It, it was about being honest with the public. Um, so I, th I think that there's, you know, the, his fundamental problem now is, is one of trust um, and a massive decline in that since from, you know, Barnard Castle to, to, to lockdown parties. You know, it's really... Can I ask you, can I ask you I think this is... I'm not even sure this is a question or even an observation. It might just be a feeling, so it doesn't necessarily get us very far. But I remember we had a conversation two years or so ago with Brandon Lewis, who was then in the cabinet. He'd just come out of one of those cabinet meetings. And the discussion was around the simplicity of government messaging. Right? And it was around why move to a complete lockdown and the wish to prevent people partying through the weekend why you couldn't say to people it's going to start on a monday because they're just going to go crazy so even though the numbers didn't quite warrant it the requirement of simple messaging did and the cabinet's position was simple messaging i don't know whether barney anyone at the institute for government or anyone has looked at this but one of the questions that i've had in the last week is if the prime minister is signaling that he's not going to resign in the event of getting a fine or a penalty notice, then by implication, whether he does or doesn't get a fine means that any of the 50 plus, maybe 90 odd people who do get uh, questionnaires from the police and then do get fines have no reason to resign either in the event the police find them in breach of those COVID restrictions, which I suppose means that the message the public is going to get is that on those kinds of things, people in high office can break the rules without consequence. And I don't know whether you're seeing any people begin to go, OK, well, what is there that's, that's somewhere between breaking and entering? People are not going to change their views on that, but they might change their views on speeding tickets or 
license fee payments or you know those things that are in the slightly grayer area of public compliance because there's a respect for authority in the way society works and and i don't know whether or not you've already seen that a change or you see any change in that you know government society or whether it's a kind of uh, i'm stroking my chin here yeah i mean that's that's a good hypothetical question but i think it's also exacerbated by the fact that the police the policing of kind of covid restrictions was really checkered as well you know yes. it, it involved this this kind of on the one hand yeah let's get people for for students for doing a party somewhere but on the other hand if some so and so is having a glass of wine somewhere that's all right you know i i think that there, there was a a real inconsistency there which makes the kind of obviously the met investigation into into these 12 gatherings in uh, uh downing street all the more important i think Barney, thank you. By the way, while I've got you there and I can see both you and uh, Ellen in the screen, I'm just going to say something to all of our Tortoise members, which is that the accelerating net zero sense maker not only tells you everything that you need to know about what's really moving in the world of climate this week, but also is a is a kind of snapshot of the fracturing of the Conservative Party between the middle and the right around climate. Covid, uh, Brexit, uh, it's brilliant. That's off to you. Um, all right. Who else? Am I? Okay. Who's on the hook? James Wilson. Can I come to you, James? Just on speaking of fracturing the Conservative Party, you, we're, we're kind of marking the Treasury's homework. Yes. So I've kind of looked into furlough and have been weighing up whether it was a good or bad idea. I think on balance, looking at the evidence, it probably was, you know, for the best because. Um, I mean, we spent an eye-watering amount and more people were furloughed in the UK than were across the rest of you in other countries in Europe, in France, in Germany, in Italy, by quite a long way. Um, about 10 million workers were benefiting from it during the first lockdown, twice as many Britons as Italians or Germans or French. Um, and it was 3.3% of GDP in 2020 was spent on the furlough scheme. Um, there was a huge fear, though, that as it wound down, as it finished, that there'd be a big, big bump in unemployment. And actually there wasn't because there was such a demand, surge of demand for retail and hospitality jobs by the time it ended in the autumn, this uh, last autumn. Um, and if you compare it to America, say, where they didn't have a furlough scheme, um, the unemployment peaked at 15% and it's still around 6%. Whilst, you know, one by the time it, it wound down here, it was only at 5%. So whilst people can look back and criticize, um, I actually think it was a success. One thing, though, that yeah, is yeah. has been a bit of a waste of money was the the fraudulent claims for the business interruption loan scheme and the bounce back schemes, which Lord Agnew famously resigned for a few weeks ago. Um, the upper estimate of the cost is 26 million from what I've researched, according to law firm. Hey, million, 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 million. Um, and million is the upper estimate of the total cost of failed loans for million oh, no 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 sorry you're correct billion billion yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um okay. three billion which is equivalent to the gdp of cyprus apparently which is quite a lot and um so one really interesting thing that i found when researching this was um an interview with the ft that some senior bank executives gave in the wake of lord agnew's resignation which um they were kind of venting about the fear that they'd be made scapegoats of in the wake of this because they're the ones giving out the loans on instructions from the government and um, one of the features of the bounce back loan was that the government expected lenders to pay out the vital funds within 24 to 48 hours of applying um, mm -hmm. because they were under such pressure after there was criticism level that the the early versions of the interruption low scheme for being too slow to help out especially the smaller businesses that applied so they just wanted to get money out the door as quickly as possible yeah but um, clearly there are big holes in this and it's led to, to fraudulent behaviour. I, th I, I think there's a really interesting question here, which is also, I, I thought the Lord Agnew resignation, or I, I, love, I rather like Lord Agnew, because in his resignation, he said, no one has any idea who I am. So the only way I'm going to draw, draw attention to this is by resigning. And it turns out it works, because now you and I are talking about Lord Agnew. We still don't know who he is, but he has actually drawn attention to this issue. The, the, the question I've got, James, is... It is, you know, notwithstanding the GDP of Cyprus, is, is 26 billion an affordable level of 
waste when a country is in a really is is in effect in cardiac arrest economically that you know you're going to throw everything at a problem I, I slightly feel the same way about some of the arguments around ppe it's like of course you're going to get too many plastic gowns you didn't know how many you needed and you just thought let's get as many as we can yeah i mean i think that i think you're right i think the unprecedented nature of the crisis means that there is a level of flexibility when, when looking back you know hindsight is a wonderful thing one thing i would point you to though in the ft interview with with, uh, with the the ft article where they they go off the record is the bank executive said Hopefully common sense will prevail, but if it doesn't, I've literally told the Treasury and Financial Conduct Authority in meetings, I hope nobody's a short memory around here, folks. I have every meeting minuted, recording everything the government said, like, get these done, get these out, cut corners. So yeah. it sounds like there was, they did play quite fast and loose. Um, I, I guess it's up to, to individuals to decide when well, we're going to be able to... Don't remember, James, what happened was at the beginning, the, the Treasury said... OK, look, we will, we will guarantee 80 percent of the money, but you banks have got to essentially be good for 20 percent and and not a penny was going out the door. And then after that, the banks, they said, we'll we'll guarantee the full 100 percent of the 50,000 bounce back loans. And, the, you know, the, the, the problem the banks had was just manning the call centers. I mean, they just literally said, OK, it's all it was all free money moving into the system. So I do have some sympathy with the bankers there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean. Um, I think that I, I, I think I think it is ultimately the responsibility lies with the government. Um, and like you say, in, in hindsight, people may look back and think, actually, unprecedented crisis, throw the kitchen sink at it. It's just yeah. self-preservation, survival mode. And, you know, things happen, but it's worth it. Let, let me go. Let me go, if I can, James, to Emma J in the beautiful county of Herefordshire. Emma. James. So, so sorry, you, you, you made a point just in the chat a little while ago, which was around the extent to which the, the recovery funds were distributed differently. Um, and the truth is, I don't know anything about this. So will you sort of explain? So here in Herefordshire, the local council have made a great thing of saying that one of the things that they put their COVID recovery funds to is providing free local bus free bus transport at the weekends across the rural county. Yeah. And it's been quite a good messaging because I think it has given an opportunity for them to talk about how they've handled one crisis, are looking to the next potential crisis, investing the money by allowing everybody to get on a bus and take a new tra use transport, local transport, etc. cetera. Um, and it is interesting. I mean, it fits into much wider agenda that they've got around trying to be, um, you know, net zero, a greener county, et cetera, et cetera. But in doing so, I obviously share this story with friends. And then we then try to find out what COVID recovery funds were doing around the country and how they were fitting into other local authorities, levelling up, et cetera. And I can't find a picture of it. You know, I'm just privy to the sorry, Emma, is it, Are you saying that they used some of the COVID recovery funds to provide the free bus, the free that, bus transport? That is the message. That's clearly the message here in Herefordshire, that we have used our COVID recovery funds. And we, they were very, they've done, they've done gym membership for 11 to 13 year olds. They've done other bits and pieces. And, but, the, but, the, but the big one was that they announced was we are going to make bus transport free for the next year using the money from the COVID recovery funds. That's really interesting. That's a really interesting subject, isn't it? Because it's not going to get, um, you're right, it's not going to get picked up because the truth is who in Norfolk is going to pay attention to what's happened in Herefordshire. We should, we, we'll, but likewise, James, <laughs> sorry to cut across you, but likewise, yeah. I'd be really interested to know what is happening in Norfolk and what they're doing, because yeah, I don't no, know what Sheffield are doing. I and would. I think, also, there's, I mean, there are great, there are some great stories in it. So I personally used it as my COVID recovery, having been completely and utterly locked down. I took yeah. it and went off around the country, had the most fantastic COVID recovery journeys by seeing bits of the country that I hadn't been able to see for the last two years. Is it, is it sorry, I'm being stupid. Is it, is it, is it, you can travel around Herefordshire or you can travel around anywhere? You can travel around Herefordshire. Wow. You can go into the deepest, darkest dales, all through a charge. And reach those places you haven't been able to go to. 
How great. Good. good story. Yeah, that is a good story. It is a really good story. All right, Emma, thank you. Um, uh, I, I wanted to just, um, hang on, who have I missed? I'm just looking at my screens. I am gonna to come to you, uh, Aid, in a moment. Um, Ella. Yes, there you are. Hi. What are we missing? Um, so I was looking at uh, care homes and um, so I guess the, the place to start really is looking at um, the deaths and the latest official data that we have on care home deaths from the ONS was released in October um, of 2021 and uh, it tracks the deaths between the 16th of March 2020 and the end of April in 2021 and in that period there were 41,000 care home residents that died of COVID-19 which represents um, in total a quarter of people who died of COVID in that period. Um, I think in our COVID inquiry last year, we looked quite heavily at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and in the first few months, so between March and June of 2020, 19,000 people had died um, in care homes. Um, and so a big, a big portion of those deaths were concentrated in the first few months of the pandemic. And we went over the reasons uh, hmm. why then, but, but a lot of that to do what was to do with uh, the discharge of um, patients from hospitals into care homes. There were 25,000 people that were discharged into care homes without testing before the 15th of April um, mm. when the rules changed about, about discharging patients from hospitals. Um, now, in, there was a big report um, from the Health and Social Care Science and Technology Com Committees, which was published in October. Um, which looked into this and uh, the government cited some Public Health England data which said that these outbreaks in care homes um, weren't necessarily seeded um, by people discharged from hospitals but the, it's, it's very difficult to say because the testing was just not there um, at yeah. the beginning stage of the pandemic. Um, it's, very, it's very difficult to say, though, Ella, that they weren't, wasn't it? I mean, the evident, the the patterns yeah. are quite, even if they're, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then the kind of other points that the report made um, was really about some of the longstanding issues um, in social care that made, you know, that compounded um, the kind of crisis that we saw in care homes in the pandemic. So. Um, lack of staffing, um, you know, the fact that care homes aren't really set up for people to um, isolate. I know that Ellen was talking about some um, evidence that she had heard from a doctor about looking at his ward about how, you know, the design of the space just isn't designed for um, kind of infection control. And that's certainly true of these communal care facilities where they're designed for people living together. At the same time, you had issues like um, with the setup of the workforce as well. So you had people who work across several different care homes. They might be part time in one, part time in another. Were they bringing infection they from moving? one place to the next? Uh, yeah. Ella, forgive me. I'm just going to. I'm just aware of the time because I, I see that um, the great Marks and Andrew, as have you seen, brought back Agatha, our tortoise, racing across the screen. And uh, she's making it very close to the finish line. So I'm going to just forgive me for interrupting you because I want to. I think I've just seen Nimmo arrive. N Nimmo, are you there? Yeah, I've been here. I've been listening. Oh, I couldn't see you. Sorry. Listen, the, the, the one thing was the second half of that of uh, James's point on sort of efficiency of government spending. Uh, um, and maybe I took a rather too lazy view of waste around PPE. I don't know, you were looking at this and also around test and trace, which is harder to take a lazy view of. What's your judgment of how the UK did on those two fronts? Um, so I think that it's very clear that at the beginning and it widely reported the failures of test and trace. And um, in terms of what I was thinking about where we could go next in terms of reporting is to see, to actually kind of put to, to the test whether or not we actually did develop that world beating system that we kept on repeating that we had back in 2020 and now the 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 
the scope of the infrastructure that we do now have and that, that is actually you know very good um and kind of figuring out from there I think that there was huge amounts of waste that was happening at the beginning of the pandemic but I think that as I think as James said earlier um or as you said it is kind of to be expected in a situation that is that was as unprecedented however another thing that I was looking at was just um, all the stuff that was coming out in terms of procurement and PPE is the supply chains. And that was kind of some of the reporting that I was doing last year about where mm. our PPE is coming from. And now that we've had enough space that we can't keep like sitting on the argument of it was at the beginning of the pandemic, we just needed to get PPE from anywhere and at uh, unprecedented levels of it. Um, I was looking at modern slavery in our supply chains and figuring out exactly how and where um, the government knew at what point did they know that there was, you know, not just in terms of like specific kinds of PPE, but all kinds of PPE. At what point did they know that they were buying from factories and, and companies where there was like a lot, a lot, a significant amount of, of modern slavery and forced labor practices going on there? I think that's something that was really interesting to me. And I think that's something that maybe we could pick up again, um, because I think that that is a lot of the discussions about procurement and sleeves has been domestic and figuring yeah. out who's been sort of giving... Um, you know, like uh, who's been giving contracts to who and their friends. However, I think there's a bigger picture, a wider story about our supply chains and how we source products um, ethically and whether or not we're actually holding ourselves to the standards that we claim that we are. Nimo, Nimo thank you. I think that's a really good point because we've never really looked at uh, looked at that and we didn't at the time. I also thought Liz did a really made an interesting point around... Um, Actually, whether or not you just do a number on test and trace, you just try and actually look at the whole process. Do you remember very early on, we did something similar around Nightingale hospitals and actually we never quite did test and trace. And Liz was saying, you know, Deloitte and the whole question. Before we're quite done though, I promise I'd come to Aid Clulo because uh, Aid, you, funny enough, you actually put your finger on one of my, the bees in my bonnet at the moment, which is all we seem to talk about is parties in Ukraine. And it may be the case that things are happening elsewhere in the world. So Serbia. Yeah, I know. I know this topic is a little bit out of uh, kilter with what we've been talking about for the last fifty-five minutes or so. But um, no, I was. I mean, I there's not enough time now to go into all of it. But I think the headlines are with the EU-sponsored dialogue between Kosovo and, and Serbia, and, and clearly there's a problem of of recognition uh, from Serbia towards Kosovo, and Serbia is supported and backed by Russia. Um, and, and Serbia putting a lot of pressure on the, uh, the appointed envoys from the EU and the United States to, uh, to pressure the Kosovan government into uh, putting in place an agreement from 2015 regarding Serb um, majority municipalities, a similar, similar political entity to that exists in Bosnia, Herzegovina. Um, but uh, the Kosovan government is is trying to push back on that because it's unconstitutional in 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 their highest court, where it's being deemed unconstitutional. Um, so meanwhile, this is going on, and there's a lot of focus on this, and, and it seems that uh, Kosovo is coming under pressure from uh, from all sides. Yet, quietly, without really anybody noticing, in the Presovo Valley in southern uh, Serbia, which is predominantly Albanian, ethnic Albanian. Uh, in 2011, the Serbs passed, uh, the Serbian parliament passed a law uh, that essentially that was described as a law to tidy up the electoral roll. Um, but, and, and probably now is not the time to get into the detail, but essentially um, it gives the police sweeping powers to, uh, to um, essentially, uh, tag a house uh, as as no longer being uh, no longer being uh, lived in no longer being um, mm -hmm. uh, in, inhabited by uh, by an Albanian ethnic Albanian family so since 2011 upwards of 4,000 Albanians have been essentially stripped of their their oh. uh, status in Serbia not been able to renew passports and ID cards and and they've had to flee Flee, they've had to leave and go to either Kosovo or North Macedonia, where where, where sorry, another, sorry, Abe, where, where it, what's the name of this valley? Presovo Valley. It's if you if you look, I know we're looking on Zoom, therefore it's not going to be quite the same, but 
if you look at Kosovo on the map, and it's just on the right hand side right. of just over the border uh, in Serbia, and that, that area there is a preserve of money. So, um, you know, there's a little bit of a lack of, hey, lack of balance to... there. Um, my colleague Kerry Thomas said, and Kerry's ideas are almost always right, and it takes me often a few weeks just to catch up with them being right, having first rejected them as being not right. <laughs> But the interesting thing about Djokovic was, it was actually, if you look at his relationship with Alexander Vucic, the president, and the politics in Serbia moving further and further to a kind of nationalist and assertive place, the, the Djokovic vaccine story is part of that same, same picture. I don't know that country or place very well. Is that, is that right? Is there, is, there some, is there some way to get into Serbia that's sort of accessible like that, i.e. Djokovic and his, and, and his Serbian politics? So, I mean, so, it's, so it, it's, a, it's a very, very sensitive, I think it's a very sensitive subject. If you, if you, look, at, if you look at the 90s, um, arguably, and, and I don't want to start a, an argument on, on this, but, you know, arguably the Serbs initiated three, uh, sorry, four conflicts, four wars, um, and uh, cost, the Kosovo War in 99, 98, 99 being the last of the four, and essentially lost them all. Um, but the, I think the interesting point, I mean, putting aside the Preservo Valley, um, you know, administrative, uh, administrative ethnic cleansing, um, mm -hmm. is the fact that now in Ukraine, um, there's reasonable, uh, there's a reasonable argument to say that Putin sees Ukraine very much in, through the same lens that, that the West saw Kosovo in that Serbia was um, needed to be needed to be ejected um, mm. and, and now and, but Kosovo is still part of Serbia um, yet uh, everybody is getting very excited about the fact that uh, Russia has is, is slowly piecemeal taking Ukrainian uh, Ukraine back oh. into its sphere of influence so I think it's just a very interesting um, yeah, yeah. It, throwback it, from '99 to to now, um, mm. but it, hey, it's just totally unreported. No, no, it's exactly it's, it, it is completely unreported, and you know you'll see one of the things we're trying to do, and I think Charles and the team on SenseMaker trying to do is making sure whether it's you know Venezuela or Burkina Faso or Myanmar or some of these stories that are happening, we're actually not losing sight of the rest of the world. So we'll make sure to, to take a proper look at that. Um, I have not for the first time run over, so great apologies for that. Thank you everyone for your patience. Thank you hugely to Phoebe and the whole team for kind of providing the beginnings of a, an outline. Um, I came away with, normally with sort of half a dozen, I've come away with pages and pages of notes, but I come away with one clear thought and a plan. The one clear thought is place. Actually, the re it's been interesting. We've been starting work, I mentioned last week, on a democracy in Britain survey and really interested in looking at democracy by place in the UK rather than by comparison with other countries. It's interesting that when you look at health impacts and all the other impacts, economic, social, um, uh, mental health impacts, actually place would be a really, really good way of understanding it, um, you know, and we could do worse than starting with, you know, Herefordshire's uh, use of the recovery fund. So that's, that's extremely helpful. And I suppose the plan is to say, actually, we need to do a second half of the COVID inquiry, possibly not a whole day, but maybe a long evening where we really try to slice and dice these issues and then come up with something that's organized in terms of a conclusion that goes towards a public inquiry as and when that ever happens. Um, Aid will pick up on the point around Serbia, but for this evening, a huge thank you. Join us tomorrow evening. Um, one of the more unlikely things that uh, has happened in the news in the last six months is that while the US is exploring the use of therapeutic MDMA, otherwise known to many people as ecstasy, therapeutic MDMA, for people suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, that General Sir Nick Carter, the person previously in charge of the British Armed Forces, has said that he thinks it's useful to start exploring MDMA use for PTSD in the UK too. 
So we're trying to understand as part of the ongoing investigations we're doing into mental health and acute issues of depression and anxiety, whether or not there are medical and um, uh, scientific breakthroughs that we're just on the threshold of. This is uh, on the back of uh, actually Phoebe Davis reporting on this. So join us tomorrow evening at 6.30 or this evening.